Hello everyone. It's indeed my pleasure to warmly welcome each and everyone tuned in for today's webinar, Creating Wealth During an Economic Downturn, brought to you by InvestTT. We are live today from the beautiful and warm Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I am Florence Ghani and I'm delighted to be your host for our second webinar for 2016. Briefly about me, I've spent the past 11 years in varying capacities in the public sector and more importantly, the last four sourcing division at InvestTT. On a daily basis, you'll find me responding to investment as well as providing ongoing support for existing investment projects as well as identifying new investors for the tourism and creative industries. So before we get started today, I'd like to highlight a few housekeeping matters to maximize your experience in today's session. At the end of today's session, we'll take a few minutes to address your questions. We also encourage you to send your questions throughout the webinar via chat. Please note that there will be a poll question, there will be a few poll questions shown on the screen during the session and it would be great if you answer these whenever you see them pop up. This will help us to get an idea of who you are and what you're interested in. So a recorded version of today's webinar will be made available to you along with a PDF version of the presentation deck which can be accessed via follow-up email and on our corporate website. So, to provide a bit of context for what you can expect from today's session, we will be touching a bit on our presenters, a bit of Trinidad and Tobago's economy, current investment opportunities, and of course, most importantly, InvestTT's role in all of this. Then, we'll be happy to take your questions and as we close, most importantly, let us know how you can contact us. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel today. Joining us for today's live session, we have Mrs. Raquel Moses, President of InvestTT, Mr. Shaumal Chandragat Singh, Vice President Investor Sourcing at InvestTT, and Ms. Stacey Adams, Vice President, Investor Services at InvestTT. Welcome everyone. Hi, Florence. So, a bit about Raquel. Raquel has led InvestTT to incredible award-winning achievements and has spent the last 20 years in various private public sector organizations. She recently has been voted as the first Vice President of Kaiper. That's the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. We'll hear more about this later in our discussions. Shamal has over 16 years of professional experience with a background in general management. His professional career and development has spanned many international organizations within the private and public sectors. At InvestTT, he is responsible for the sourcing and securing of investment into Trinidad and Tobago. It's great to have you here, Shamal. That's good. Happy to be here. Stacy brings over a decade of progressively responsible experience in management in the Caribbean's leading business hubs. At InvestTT, she is responsible for the provision of services to investors who have made the decision to establish operations here in Trinidad and Tobago. Stacy, a very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you. Good morning, Florence. Good morning to everyone listening. Okay. As we have everyone on board, we'd like to dive into showing you how you can create wealth during this economic downturn. We want to just learn from our audience what their expectations are for today's session. Our first poll is up and we'd really like to hear from you. Just check the box slash type in your feedback and click send. 
while we await those responses, let's set the context and get the discussion going. Raquel, first of all, welcome once again. Can you tell us what, in your opinion, is happening with the current state of the Trinidad and Tobago's economy? Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, the current state of Trinidad and Tobago's economy is that it is quite solid. Um, although we're having an economic decline and, and certainly affected by global oil and gas, gas prices, what we do know is that our fundamentals remain quite strong. Our uh, uh, GDP, as an example, when you look at the IMF's ranking of our GDP per person parity, uh, we are ahead of both Latin America and the Caribbean. We are leading in that, in that sphere. When you look at things like our debt to GDP ratio, they have been under 50% for the last 10 years. Our credit rating from Standard & Poor's is an A-, minus, and our unemployment has been below 4% for at least the last three years. And all of those things are really great indicators as to uh, the strength of our current economy. But what's more important is when you look at some longer term uh, indicators. So when you look at things like primary school enrollment, which will not just affect what's happening now, but will affect our long term prospects as a country, um, our primary school enrollment is over 100%. So that means that all children of primary school age are enrolled in primary school and some others are enrolling early so that they are able to get a head start in their education. That combined with our free tertiary education framework as a country means that not only do we have a solid foundation now, but we have a lot to build upon in the future. So despite what's happening currently with petrochemical pricing and you know it's 40% it's of the government's revenue, 80% of our exports, and, and uh, you know, under, just under 50% of our GDP, it still means that our long-term fundamentals are, are quite positive. That's excellent. So while we await, and while, while that sounds quite encouraging, we are aware that the drastic drop in petrochemical pricing has adversely impacted Trinidad and Tobago's economy, yes? Absolutely. Shouldn't this be a time for people to be cautious and not invest? I, I actually, Florence, I think quite the opposite. I think this is the time where people should be looking to get into industries that are recession-proof, and they should also be using this time to make strategic moves. What you typically find when there's a bit of an economic slowdown is that there are um, <clears throat> you have less business, and that's the time to kind of take a step back and retool your organization to be even more competitive. So there are, uh, based on the Harvard Business Review, there are four key responses that can help to protect your organization in these um, times where there is slowdown or contraction. And it is to be prevention focused. So develop defensive moves in your strategy as a company that helps you to be more competitive. So protect your turf as well as um, be promotion focused. One of the biggest mistakes that companies make is that they don't focus on promoting their business during times of economic decline. This is the time where you can get ahead of your competition. People are pricing in terms of ways of promoting your business. It would, it, people are more inclined to negotiate right now. And so in that time, you can actually get some really good deals. You also need to be pragmatic as a company. So you need to combine some sense of defending your turf with being uh, having some offensive moves. This is the time to outrun your competition. And then you also need to be progressive. You need to deploy the optimal level of, again, being pragmatic while being on the offense. So this is the time to capture new market share. Definitely. So we're seeing here that timing is critical. And it also calls for thinking outside the box and, of course, you know, really digging deep as an organization to see exactly, you know, what, how can I become more involved. Definitely. All right. So as we think about that for a moment, mm -hmm. we would like to... just right. ask you to 
you know, tell us a bit about, you know, the Ministry of Trade and their role in all of this. Right. So they've had they've had a very uh, similar position to ours in that they believe as well, and the, the Honorable Minister, in a speech that she gave quite recently, talked about the fact that to survive and be successful post-recession, companies should seize opportunities during a recession. And we wholeheartedly agree as the National Investment Promotion Agency. We believe that this is a time where there are an abundance of opportunities for people who realize that they can get out ahead of their competitors. So this is the time to get into business. Anything that you create right now is going to be recession proof because if you can survive and thrive during this time, during times of feast, it's going to be even more successful and even even more profitable. So we, we completely agree and support the Ministry of Trade as we that is our line ministry in terms of how we are able to um, promote investment at this time. Well, Raquel, that's indeed very interesting. That's, uh, I think, very interesting. And because most people see an economic downturn as a time for cutbacks and caution. In fact, have you seen the results of a study conducted in 2010 by the Harvard Business Review, which examined responses of businesses to periods of economic slowdown? Yes, and, and so we just uh, we just went through that. So um, I think I think that these are the things that happen. What we find is that um, out of that study, only nine percent of the companies adopted the suggestions of being prevention focused, promotion focused, pragmatic, etc. And so those nine percent of companies flourished, and because they were able to master that delicate balance, they reduce their cost selectively. So rather than reducing costs using a hammer, they used a scalpel. And they really took a serious and, and a specific look at the cost in their business and what were the things that they needed to do to help them through this time. They also invested in things like marketing and research and development. And most companies during times of economic decline, that's what they cut back. They cut back on research and development and marketing. And those are two things that help protect you through these times. So I think that um, the, the survey is very telling about what happens with the 9%. Great. So I think we, we need to reinforce uh, the need for re-examining your strategy and, of course, you know, really thinking outside the box and trying to see, instead of uh, holding back, how you can now take advantage of the current situation. Folks, we want to help you secure your future success. And that's what our webinar today is focused on. We're going to share some investment opportunities with you that you can that will make you become part of that nine percent. We're also going to talk about a number of industries that have by you know identified by our government for development in this regard. And at this time we do have a poll up and we'd like to find out in what industries are you interested in investing. But before we move on, let's consider these industries of interest. Raquel, tell us about the local industries that you believe have the capacity to be recession-proof. Which ones are we covering today? So um, in terms of the government policy framework, we have uh, all of the sectors that we cover, I believe, have some, to some extent, are recession-proof. We, we, we work on average business and people will always eat. We work on tourism, and people will always take vacation with their families. And we manufacture because Trinidad and Tobago, as you know, is the manufacturing hub of the region, and that is something that will always be required. We also focus on aviation services, which is a nice partner to uh, tourism, of course, because most people fly to get to their well, many people fly to get to their vacations. Um, creative industries, because of the creativity that's here, and the 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 products and services that that has the capacity to provide. We also look at fishing and fish processing because we're an island and so we have abundant resources both um, on land with aquaculture as well as uh, in the sea. Uh, we also focus on the maritime industry again because we're an island and we're so close to the Panama Canal as you know they opened the Panama Canal two days ago and in doing that we are so well positioned to be able to take advantage of the post-Panamax um, ship sizes that may need services or 
need to transship or may need dry docking services as an, as an example. And we're also focused on ICT and ICT globally. ICT globally is such a dynamic and um, has such potential, but it is as an as an industry. When you look at you know the last hundred years, it's it's in its infancy, and so there's so much more that's possible in ICT as well. So those are the things that we focus on that we believe all have the capacity to be recession proof because they are Trinidad and Tobago focusing on our core competencies and our core value proposition as a country. And so today we're going to talk about tourism, agribusiness, and manufacturing. But there are still many more things that if you want to look at specific opportunities, we have an entire list of them on our website. But on top of that, you have the ability to come up with your own opportunity that InvestTT can help you through. Thank you, Raquel. You've actually shared quite a bit for us to think about. And as we, as we just think about, you know, the impact of what Raquel has just shared, uh, Shamal, you've worked closely with stakeholders in the local tourism industry over the past few years. Can you share some insight into why tourism is one that we should pursue for investment? Absolutely, Flo. Uh, I think let's start by looking at sort of the global context for tourism and uh, sort of why it would be a great industry to look at in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, so let's look at the results of the WTO 2015 report on the tourism industry. Uh, some of the indicators that really stand out are 9% of GDP globally originates from the tourism sector. One in 11 jobs are sort of directly or indirectly related to the tourism sector. It generates $1.5 trillion in exports. Uh, and it represents 6% of the world's exports and 30% of services exports. So, you know, they're very compelling figures globally as to why tourism is a recession-proof industry. That's great. Let's zoom into the region and at home here in Trinidad and Tobago. How does it look? Definitely. Uh, given the significant contribution to the GDP of other CARICOM countries by tourism, one would think that this industry should play a major role in the makeup of Trinidad and Tobago's economy. However, currently it only represents 4.4% of our GDP directly and 8.4% in total. That's also the indirect contribution. Uh, if we compare that to one of our closest neighbors like Barbados, the potential seems obvious. Tourism contributes 12.3% directly to the GDP and 41.6% in total through indirect uh, jobs and follow-on business opportunities. Uh, Trinidad Tobago provides a substantial difference in opportunity from the other tourism-related countries in the Caribbean. Uh, overall, we, we receive about 453,000 visitor arrivals every year. Uh, and Trinidad is labeled as the business capital of the Caribbean. So what you find is that we actually have this very tourism offering that goes everywhere from convention-type tourism uh, into ecotourism and a number of other fields that you uh, would find are unique to Trinidad and Tobago. We also have a number of flag hotels. That means that they have a, a brand on them in Trinidad. Uh, and there's an immediate opportunity for conference tourism through those brand hotels like the Hyatt Regency and the Hilton. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the opportunity for bird watching, uh, where because we share the flora and fauna of both the Caribbean and South America, you have a unique blend uh, of both those, both those things here. And ecotourism is absolutely something that is Trinidad Tobago is well renowned for. In fact, we have the oldest forest reserve in the world in Tobago. Uh, and we also are now showing a great potential for medical tourism. That's excellent, Shamal. But as you know, we are Trinidad and Tobago. So how does Tobago fit into this picture? Well, Tobago offers that ideal Caribbean experience. And the Tobago industry is very interesting because it's comprised predominantly of boutique hotels. In fact, there are no flag carriers in Tobago right now. Most of the boutique hotels are in the three to four star range. Uh, but 54% of Tobago's population is directly and indirectly employed in the tourism industry. Therefore, there are immediate opportunities to build higher scale, five star level hotels. Uh, and to strategically bring a flag carrier, such as uh, Hilton or Hyatt, into the Tobago market. 
Excellent, Shamal. That's some really great insight you've just provided. Now let's look at some of the benefits of investing in tourism in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, there are definitely some very unique and diverse offerings. The islands are a good proposition for travelers or families who are looking for an immersive and varied vacation, which could be tied maybe into a business trip. Uh, you know, we have the arts and culture represented so strongly. There's a, a carnival in Trinidad, which, you know, I may be very biased, but I'll say it's the best carnival in the world. Uh, it's definitely one of the oldest, uh, and it is definitely very world-renowned. Uh, we also have, as I've spoken about before, this very nature, and definitely, you know, it, very recently you'll find on Facebook or on social media a lot of representation of Trinidadian foods, uh, you know, uh, showing things like doubles and roti that come from Trinidad uh, as, uh, you know, this very unique food. In fact, we were actually ranked recently uh, by one online poll as one of uh, the most diverse cuisine locations in the world. Uh, we also uh, a commercial and entertainment center in the Caribbean. You know, soca music, chutney music, calypso, limbo, the steel pan, they all come from Trinidad and Tobago. We also have strong domestic and international demand for resort products. So other than just catering for the current uh, global sort of traveler coming into Trinidad, we also generate a large domestic tourist from Trinidad to Tobago and from Trinidad into beaches. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we also have strong sustained demand for business hotel rooms. In fact, in S the STR report for 2014 and 2015 showed a 9% greater demand than supply in business hotel rooms. So there's an immediate demand that can be filled. That's excellent. Uh, Shermal, so does the state allow incentives to invest in tourism? Absolutely. There is a tax exemption for a period uh, not exceeding seven years uh, with, uh, with respect to gains or profits. Uh, we also have a capital allowance. There is also uh, a losses carry forward. Um, there are incentives to do things like bring in vehicles or uh, equipment required for your tourism type business. But there, you know, there's a whole list of incentives. So we'll be happy to share with anybody who would like to get in contact with us about a tourism opportunity. Okay, that's that's really excellent news, and that's good to hear. Uh, so, Shamal, uh, can you tell us, having heard all of that, we'd like to know what are some of the investment opportunities that that people can invest in now? Well, I'm really glad you asked that because I think we have some really great ones. Uh, Las Cuevas Estate, which is 18 kilometers north of Port of Spain, about a 45 minute drive. Uh, it, it's, it's actually known as one of our best beaches. We have a picture of it up on the slide right now. It's a beautiful crescent bay. Uh, it's actually a blue flag beach, so it's uh, known as an eco-friendly beach. Uh, and there's a private developer that uh, owns a significant portion of land off the, the actual beach itself. It's about 500 acres of land, beachfront property. And uh, what the developer would like to do is develop two four to five star level hotels. Uh, he has two 10 acre plots that are put aside for the development of these hotels. And as we spoke about before, uh, Trinidad generates a lot of domestic tourism. Right? One of the, I guess, benefits of living on a beautiful Caribbean island is that we as Trinidadians get to take uh, advantage of the wonderful natural resources that we have here. Which means that in building a, a, a high uh, four or five star level hotel uh, in, in Las Cuevas would not only be able to create tourism opportunities for tourists traveling in to Trinidad, but would also provide uh, a location for tourists from Trinidad and both and Tobago and other Caribbean islands to take advantage of uh, the opportunity to stay at this beach. So for our listeners who are probably wondering, well, you know, this is something that I'm interested in. Are there any documents that are needed up front when inquiring about this opportunity? Well, you know, we, we want to make sure that anybody who's interested in investing in these opportunities has an opportunity to do so. So, uh, you know, definitely if uh, somebody wants to uh, get in touch with us, you can get in touch with us through our website, uh, through info at investtt.co.tt. Uh, you can reach out to us personally. Uh, our contact information is generally attached to the opportunities on our website. Uh, you can also get in touch with us through social media. What we really want you to do is make that initial contact 
and then we'll talk about sort of what documents you may potentially need. Great, thank you so much. So Shamal, are there any other foreign opportunities within the tourism industry? Most definitely. If you switch over to Tobago, we have the historic Blue Haven Hotel. It is actually a, a legacy property in Tobago. It's located just five minutes from Scarborough, and it actually currently has 55 rooms. But there are outline approvals for 104 rooms along with villas on the property. Uh, the property is actually ready for immediate sales. And uh, it's an award-winning property. Many very famous people have stayed there over the years. Uh, and it's run by uh, a couple right now uh, that uh, are known for the great service that they offer. So that also has a great reputation. Um, it's, uh, as I said, available for immediate sale at around $14 million, which is the asking price. And we think it's actually a great opportunity for somebody who's looking to get into the trend or the Tobago-specific market right now. Definitely, we can certainly see why. Shamal, would you also say that there are opportunities to partner with a brand? Well, most definitely. As we were saying earlier, uh, Tobago is actually a location which is fully boutique at the moment which means that there are no flags. And of course, there's a benefit to having a flag or a brand associated with any island. You know, they have their own booking systems, etc., uh, that would generate tourists outside of the location uh, having its reputation. Uh, and so, you know, any, any location would want to have a balance between the boutique offering and the flag offering. So I think there's definitely an immediate opportunity for a brand to come into a place like Tobago and, and Blue Haven would actually be a great property to have a flag associated with it. You know, Shamal, as we speak about tourism, are there any opportunities for public-private partnerships? Well, uh, you know, at this time, uh, we, we, we don't have any that are currently on offer, but we do have uh, some government assets, the Magdalena in Tobago and the Hilton in Trinidad, which are government-owned and, and have reached a level of maturity. So, uh, you know, there, there may be an offering uh, in the future, and we also have number of government-related tourism sites uh, that may be offered in the future uh, for potential foreign direct investment or local investment. These are some really fantastic opportunities that have the potential to compete with regional brands. Stacy, you deal mainly with local investors, right? Why don't you tell us a bit about some of the opportunities currently being pursued in tourism? Thanks, Bo. Well, the good news is that many local investors are well aware of the tremendous potential of the tourism industry. You'd appreciate that developing the industry is more than attracting hotels and increasing the room count. There's an entire ecosystem that needs to be developed for the tourism product to run like a well oiled machine. There are opportunities for services to build out um, the tourism ecosystem, for example the hosting of activities and festivals, the establishment of attractions. We currently have investors pursuing the development of amusement and theme parks, entertainment spaces that meet international standards and which can comfortably accommodate the thousands uh, who attend our large carnival fets and competitions or even the massive festivals we have every year. We even have um, persons looking at providing spaces for wholesome family entertainment. So we don't only cater to the adult tourists, but to the entire, but to entire families as well. Opportunities for new tourist publications, high-end shopping malls that have high-end products are also part of the mix. Great. And how about the maritime industry? Well, that's a, a very interesting one and one that's getting um, particular attention right now by government. Government's official the policy framework uh, has identified the maritime sector as one of the sectors for development. Earlier this month, our Minister of Trade and Industry, Paula Lobby-Scone, outlined the framework for the development of the industry, and it includes the expansion of the ship repair and dry docking facilities, expansion of the transshipment industry, expansion of coal stacking. But investors looking on from a tourism perspective can look forward to opportunities in developing marinas, uh, yachting infrastructure, and services. It really is an industry ripe for investment. Exciting times indeed, Stacey. Well, another targeted industry is manufacturing. But at this point, we have another poll up for our audience. Folks, if you are interested in investing in Trinidad and Tobago, we'd like to have an idea of the range of your consideration. 
Back to you, Shamal. Exactly how attractive is Trinidad and Tobago's manufacturing industry today? Well, Flo, you know, Trinidad and Tobago is the manufacturing hub of the Caribbean. It actually contributes about 9% of GDP and employs roughly 51,000 persons in its current uh, iteration. Uh, some of the key clusters in manufacturing in Trinidad and Tobago are wood products, textiles, uh, food and beverage, printing and packaging, assembly type uh, manufacturing, chemical and, and, and mineral byproducts, uh, and uh, well, food beverages, uh, as well, which is we said. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's actually a, a sector that is very well developed. Great. So, does it make sense for a global manufacturer to expand operations in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, I, I would definitely say so. I think let's first look at the drivers of, of what makes a, a location a great manufacturing location. If we look at the study that was done by Deloitte uh, and the U.S. Council for Competitiveness uh, in 2016, it really highlights that talent and cost competitiveness are the two greatest drivers of uh, a manufacturing location. Indeed. Shamal, tell us how does Trinidad and Tobago measure up to these two main drivers? Well, you know, as, as we were saying, you know, because of the fact that Trinidad and Tobago has an experienced manufacturing industry, you find a lot of manufacturing type talent. Everything from prototyping, uh, designing machines, the skilled and semi-skilled workforce that would be required for it, as well as the unskilled workforce. Uh, you find JV partners uh, who help understand the manufacturing processes themselves. Uh, and as uh, our president, uh, Raquel, had said earlier, uh, there is actually free time tertiary education, which means that there is always a skill set in partnership with academia being developed to support expansion of the manufacturing industry. When we look at cost competitiveness, we have one of the lowest business costs in Central America and the Caribbean. In fact, according to FDI Magazine's uh, report on the countries of the future of Central America and the Caribbean, we've ranked number one for cost, uh, cost effectiveness for both the 2013 and 2015 biannual uh, studies. Uh, if, to, to give you an idea of some of the costs, we have uh, an energy cost or electricity cost as low as three cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that would put us as one of the lowest costs in the world and definitely uh, one of the top two in the Western Hemisphere. That's... Go ahead, sir. Sorry, that's great. I, was just, I just wanted to refer back to some of the drivers we had on the list before. Does TNT have a competitive advantage in any of them? Well, most definitely. Uh, you know, we, we do have things like our... Uh, substantial supplier network. We, we have a, a strong port infrastructure here. We have two commercial ports, uh, as well as other both large ports, uh, about seven of them, and harbors. Uh, we also offer very strong uh, government going to bat for you in, in terms of taxation treaties, and uh, those are in place with about 15 countries uh, internationally, which means that you can access your raw materials from other countries in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, duty free generally into the country, as well as providing the market to, to access when your products are finished. And of course, the shipping network, because Trinidad and Tobago is the manufacturing hub of the Caribbean, to support you both getting your inputs and outputs uh, taken care of. We also have physical infrastructure that supports the manufacturing industry. Uh, we were ranked number one uh, in the Caribbean for the quality of an overall infrastructure. And in terms of market attractiveness, we provide market access to over 947 million people through our trade agreements. Great. You know, while we while we just ponder that for a moment, you know, I'm sure our listeners would like to know, of course, well, what are the incentives that are offered? Definitely. Uh, so for manufacturing, we do have a number of fiscal incentives. Uh, manufacturing entities in Trinidad and Tobago benefit from uh, both fiscal tax type incentive and import duty concessions. Uh, with the fiscal incentives, you will be able to get uh, sort of uh, a tax consideration uh, and you get the importation of both your capital items, which would be your manufacturing equipment, and uh, your inputs to production duty free 
uh, so that we would be able to now promote, of course, exports. Great. So let's talk about our major export partners. Who are they? Well, we actually have very diverse export partners. Uh, we, the, the top locations are the United States, Argentina, Chile, the Dominican Republic, and then the CARICOM region, which is our sort of domestic uh, trading partner. Great. So this now brings us to the agribusiness sector. What can you tell us about the agribusiness sector currently? Well, you know, Flo, this is one that I feel very passionate about. I think agribusiness uh, is an area that Trinidad and Tobago has really thrived at in terms of the natural bounty, right? You know, we, we uh, have amongst the best pepper and cocoa in the world. The sector itself contributes $920 million to non-energy GDP. Uh, and the, sex, the, the sector uh, is in, uh, expected to grow 3.8%. Uh, well, sorry, it did grow 3.8% in 2014, uh, with 10.5% of the country's land space used for agricultural purposes. But, you know, we've had a lot of talk of, about a, a high food import bill, which is just around just over $4 billion. How important is this sector if we are to reduce that? Well, it, it's very crucial uh, in terms of reducing the food import bill, and there are a number of opportunities that the Ministry of Agriculture has actually uh, put out and will be putting out in the near future to support import substitution for local domestic consumption. But there are also a number of new approaches to agriculture that would support uh, the, the sort of increase in production in Trinidad and Tobago. You have things like uh, ICT being used in uh, the, the process of production. You have the, the creation of integrated systems, things that are maybe combining aquaculture with uh, hydroponic type farming. You have uh, stacked type farming, vertical farming that make better usage of land. So there are a number of opportunities. We're beginning to see a picture forming here, Shamal, and the possible synergies between three key sectors. That's tourism, agri-processing, and manufacturing, right? Would you say this may have been deliberate on the part of the government? Yeah, I would definitely say so. There, there is definitely a trend when you look at it. So the increase in agribusiness supports tourism. Uh, tourism, as it grows, begins to support uh, the development of skills in the maritime industries from the yachting industry. The yachting industry creates skills that support the maritime you know, you, you, you definitely see a level of symbiosis developing between sectors that are promoted for investment. Great. Are there specific incentives to persons who want to invest in this industry and perhaps any examples of joint ventures? Definitely. Uh, there are incentives in place and they really pertain to Trinidad and Tobago nationals. So it would be great for diaspora persons looking to invest in, in our business uh, and definitely a barrier for foreign investors to partner with local business people uh, to take advantage of those incentives, which range from subsidies or grants that pertain to vehicles that are used or equipment used in manufacturing, uh, and also uh, tax incentives that are based on agricultural output. So what's new on the horizon for this particular industry? Well, uh, there are a lot of new investment opportunities that we can take a look at. And really, they, they stem from the areas where Trinidad and Tobago has excellence. Uh, the first opportunity that I'd like to talk about is in pepper. In pepper, there are opportunities for the creation of pepper mash and pepper processing, as well as creation of pepper oil. Now, Trinidad and Tobago produces uh, five of the top 20 hottest peppers in the world. Uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Maruga scorpion pepper is actually the hottest naturally occurring pepper in the world. Uh, and each fruit, which is about the size of a golf ball, contains the capsaicin, which is what makes a pepper hot, uh, in equivalent to about 25 milliliters of police-grade pepper spray. That's a lot of heat. Uh, the the right, right, right below the Maruga scorpion is a scoop, the scorpion butch tea and the Carvalho hot. And there are various other species of hot peppers in Trinidad and Tobago. The demand for pepper mash and other pepper products from Trinidad is, is definitely growing 
in recent times. Uh, and we feel very confident that this, this is an area that will continue to grow in Trinidad and Tobago. What about real estate, Shamal? What's, what's the availability for ventures such as these? Well, you know, our, our sister company, eTech, has a, a number of industrial parks uh, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And within those industrial parks, we'd be happy to really talk to any investor about how we can get them situated, as well as, you know, generally invest ET. Uh, part of our job really is to make sure that we help investors to locate land sites suitable for uh, any agribusiness type investment. That's great. Now let's talk a bit about the cocoa industry. Sure. So let's talk about the fact that Trinidad and Tobago has a rich history in cocoa. In fact, the Trinitario, Criollo, uh, and um, Forestero versions of Trinidad cocoa have been ex exported from our cocoa gene bank throughout the world. We actually have a suitable soil uh, that has supported the development of a, 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 a very prime reputation for the Trinidad and Tobago cocoa industry worldwide. Uh, fine flavored cocoa accounts for about 5% of world production, and Trinidad and Tobago is 100% finer flavored cocoa. Uh, which means that we actually garner a higher price worldwide than other locations. That's fantastic, Shamal. Stacy, Shamal will have spoken quite a bit on the opportunities in cocoa, and perhaps many persons may have been genuinely unaware that Trinidad and Tobago has internationally recognized award-winning fine-flavored cocoa. Is there any other area in which we may have expertise or may be considered leaders, particularly in the field of manufacturing? Well, Flo, Trinidad and Tobago benefits from manufacturing expertise in several well-established clusters. The first one that comes to mind is the pool and beverage cluster, which Shema would have spoken to a bit earlier. Um, with approximately 420 registered firms, the strength of Trinidad and Tobago's pool and beverage industry is well known in CARICOM and regional markets. It's part of an established value chain with links to printing and packaging and R&D. From an investment standpoint, there is remarkable opportunity for new levels of investment in the local food and beverage cluster. Um, not only has the downturn in the energy sector placed greater onus on the manufacturing industry to shore up the economy, but it has also led to a depreciation in the exchange rate, which makes imports more expensive and exports more competitive. And the sector continues to offer significant investment opportunities, particularly to manufacturers who use regional agro products and who may want to tap into the growing global appetite for exotic and gourmet foods and move beyond the traditional focus on diaspora markets. Um, from a printing and packaging perspective, that industry is well, very well established. As of 2013, the industry comprised about 225 firms and contributed about 3% of GDP annually. All indications are that it will continue to grow um, and with tremendous potential as a lot of the new players who are coming on board are focusing on innovation as they continue to enter the market. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, Shamal, earlier you mentioned fisheries as a focus of your attention. Can you share some insight into this industry? We haven't been hearing much of it. Yeah, definitely. So according to the Ministry of Food Production, the total production of fish from capture fisheries was between 12 to 15,000 tons annually, uh, while the consumption of farm fish from aquaculture is around 112 tons in Trinidad alone. Uh, the, the local market, actually, and we should really speak about the fact that Trinidad Tobago's domestic market is actually the Caracon region, uh, is, is roughly uh, about 17.9 million persons for fish and fish products. And, you know, when you look sort of globally at our trading partners, because of our, our signature to the EPA, uh, the EU's self-sufficiency uh, in seafood is projected to continue to decline. Uh, and it's actually the, globally the biggest importer of seafood. So that's an immediate opportunity for Trinidad and Tobago uh, based seafood companies to access the EU market. So what are some of the fish that we are actually looking at? So some of the, the, the fish that we are looking to ideally farm in Trinidad and Tobago are the pompano, cobia, yellowtail, kingfish, and then shrimp as well. So for persons interested in this opportunity, can you 
tell us a little more about this system? Sure. So uh, our sister company, the Seafood Industry Development Company, uh, has been doing a lot of work in making uh, sort of test systems for this reticulate, recirculated aquaculture system, or the RAS. Uh, this system actually is an on-land seawater system for producing the, the, the fish and shrimp that I just spoke about. They actually have pilot programs that have developed this fish, and they've actually been selling uh, the very high-quality output to local uh, resellers and to restaurants with very rave reviews. So what they are doing is they, are, uh, they will be able to provide technical consultancy as well as uh, things such as fish feed at cost and other sort of incentives to people who are interested in developing the system. The manner that they have developed the RAS system is actually uh, modular so that uh, you can invest in any sort of side system from the basic singular module and then duplicate that many times into uh, additional larger type investments if you would like to enjoy economies of scale. Shamal, this is exciting as well as fascinating and I now understand why you're, you have such a passion about this uh, sector. By now folks, you must be wondering how can you access the investment opportunities we discussed today in tourism, manufacturing and agribusiness? Well, this is where InvestCity comes in. But before we do, Shamal, can you tell us, uh, before we get to that, we do have a poll. Have you heard of InvestTiti prior to registering for this webinar? Stacy, you have oversight of our local investor market. What are people looking to invest CT for and how do we cater for their investment needs? Well, uh, as the National Investment Promotion Agency, our mandate is to attract, facilitate and retain local and foreign investors. Perhaps one of the greatest misconceptions is that we are here to help only foreign investors and this is a misconception that affects other regional investment promotion agencies as well, not just InvestTT. We'd like you to consider us your partner in bringing your investments to reality. The value we bring is that we will work intimately with you to provide reliable information, timely facilitation, and the strategic interventions to reduce the transaction times for the successful implementation of your investment projects. We'll, we basically hold your hand through the pre-investment, operational, and post-investment stages. Mm -hmm. We also have in our arsenal what we call the FAST Committee. FAST stands for the Facilitation, Approvals, and Strategy Team. It's a committee of representatives from 10 approval stakeholder agencies that will give you as the investor direct access to the right people to fast track your applications. Um, the FAST membership includes representatives from TCPD, Customs and Immigration, Ministry of National Security's Work Permit Section, the Ministry of Trade itself, the EMA, the Trades License Unit, and others all working together to reduce transaction timelines for applications. Excellent. Stacey, can you share some of your recent examples of successful interventions? I'd be happy to. And the first one that comes to mind is Unicoma's US $60 million Freeport campus. You can't miss it uh, once you're traveling down the Solomon Ho Choi Highway to Freeport. For those of you who have done that journey recently, it's a 23-acre site that will house Unicoma's regional head office, distribution center, and mega store. It's interesting to note that Trinidad was one of several Caribbean countries being considered for that investment. InvestIT successfully lobbied for TNT to be the location of choice, and we engaged several agencies, including the Ministry of Works and Transport, the EMA, Immigration Division, and others, to make that investment a reality. It's something we're quite proud of um, once you travel down that side. Um, another example would be the sourcing of the very first tenant at the flagship building at the Tamina Intech Park and that tenant is ICO. ICO is one of the largest international BPO operators and they made Trinidad their 17th location last year. They've been expanding since first becoming operational and have created over 300 jobs. We had to engage PTSC, Customs and Immigration, and several other government agencies to make that investment a reality. So that's another one we're quite proud of as well. For those of you who may be tuned in from Colombia, you'd be happy to, you'd be happy to know that Caracol TV uh, was in Tobago, and they're currently wrapping up a shoot there. 
Um, Caracol TV is the largest national television network in Colombia. Oh, I'm sorry. I gather that the honorary consul is listening as well. Welcome. We're very, very happy to have you. And we're very happy to welcome Caracol TV. Arthur Fernandez. So, um, honorary consul, and hopefully you're listening. And thank you so very much. This was his effort to assist us in providing this lead and this introduction to Caracol TV that has resulted in over 200 temporary jobs in Tobago over a period of three months. So we are in eternally grateful for your support. Yes. And um, we, would, we would have had to engage the Tobago House of Assembly, Customs and Immigration and others as well. And that Caracol TV investment pumped the U.S. 3.5 million into Tobago's eco economy for the duration of the shoot. Um, so the, the three projects that we just spoke about were all won by Investi team. And although they actually fall outside of the specific sectors covered today, I think they speak to the range of investments we attract and reflect, they reflect the broad scope of our facilitation activities and the types of strategic interventions that we take on behalf of our investors. So we are here, we are all quite ready and willing to help you get your next investment up and running. Great. Thank you, Stacey. So we've now come to the end of our discussion, and I'd like to thank our panel for joining us today. Thank you, folks. Today we've heard a lot of the current economic landscape of Trinidad and Tobago, but more importantly, investment opportunities you can take advantage of through the assistance of Invest TT. At this time, we're happy to take your questions. And while we're waiting for your questions, I wanted to I understand our, our ambassador, Dr. Emery Brown from uh, Brazil is also on the webinar. And uh, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it and the enthusiasm that you shared with us when we last had a chat about InvestTT and our ability to generate investment from our, our foreign missions. We know that you are in Brazil uh, preparing for our athletes, which I understand will arrive in three weeks, and looking to help us with generating new sources of investment from Brazil. So we look forward to getting those leads from you. We wish to thank everyone for participating in our webinar today. And we're happy to look at a few questions now. And please do contact us with one of your requests for information at the address listed on your screen. And also, please, we welcome you to visit our website, www.investt.co.tt, and learn more about the available opportunities. So we do have Raquel, Shamal, and Stacey available to take your questions. So we have one question. It's, as an investor, is there access to a certified database of vertic vertically and horizontally integrated service providers? Stacey? Um. <laughs> well, the, you know, yes, there is yes and no. Um, we are soon to launch our new website, and in that website, uh, we would have new services for our current investors. So we would have a, not necessarily a database, but we would be able to provide you um, an investor that comes to us with um, service providers related to your investment. But to say that we have an online certified database, we don't exactly have that, but it's one of the things that we're looking at as a service that we would provide in the future. But we can, for any investor, identify their, their, their value chain for them. And, um, you know, as, a, as an agency, we don't charge any fees, so we don't have any opportunities to earn revenue. So this might be one of those things that we can consider <laughs> as a revenue generator for us in the future. I think we got that question from TTCSI. TTCSI, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, <laughs> that was misinformation. Yes, we can, we can, um, we work with TTCSI to be able to um, provide access to our service providers. The tourism data was actually uh, Caribbean specific, not CARICOM specific. So the question was, the Caribbean tourism data that were shared, uh, was it CARICOM specific or Caribbean geographic region specific? And it was specific to the Caribbean region. With the CTO, Caribbean Tourism Organization, collects from uh, CARICOM uh, as well as the Greater uh, Caribbean.
Do we have any other questions? Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Well, if, if, while we wait for more questions or, or uh, while you're thinking through your questions on, on what we've presented, we really do want to uh, direct you to our, our current website if you have any questions or if you're looking for any information. That's the easiest way as well to contact us. Uh, you can send an email, as Sean mentioned, to info at investtt.co.tt and send us what, what we are typically referred to as a request for information. So if you have a specific investment project in mind. Um, as an agency, we tend to deal with larger investments because we are charged with the humongous um, mandate of diversification. What it means for some of our small investors is that we can help to refer you to some of the agencies like NEDCO and, and other agencies that, that are able to help sort of uh, startups or, or new investors. But regardless of whether you're very large or very small, we have a wealth of information on our website and we look forward to hearing from you so that we have the ability to assist you through your investment process. Folks, just to re reiterate, a recorded version of today's webinar will be made available to you along with a PDF version of the presentation deck which can be accessed via follow-up email and on our corporate website. I think we post it on YouTube as well, no? Yes, we do. We yes. Do. And we have, we have other webinars that are also posted there from, uh, as Florence mentioned in the beginning, this is our second one. So we, <laughs> we have the, the other webinar that we uh, delivered on YouTube, on our InvestTT channel. Hopefully you will follow us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And uh, we have the YouTube channel. And we look forward to hearing from you. We're currently contemplating Instagram because there's such fabulous photographs of Trinidad and Tobago that are available. And with that, we have come to the end of our webinar. And so we thank you all for your participation. And Florence, if you have any final words, I think. I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will be signing out from the sunny and warm, beautiful Trinidad and Tobago. Bye. 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 And thanks to our marketing team who provided tremendous support in allowing us to get this webinar off the ground. Oh, no. Is it cheating? You can answer it there. Yeah. I think it's still on. So, yeah, go ahead. Tobago has no marina. We have another question. Tobago okay. has no marina. To what extent is changing this a priority? Would invest in this arena have to work mainly with the THA or central government? I think it would be an opportunity that we would work together. So we would work, Invest TT with the THA would work together on a marina project. There are some that are expected for Tobago. And I think that um, it is identifying the approved location and agreeing on the approved location. So we would work uh, being guided by the THA to assist any investor interested in our project. Yeah, absolutely. There are a number of private sector initiatives, uh, and uh, the THA has uh, shown and expressed uh, a great interest in having uh, a marina in Trinidad, uh, oh, sorry, in Tobago. Uh, so definitely uh, we would be a great conduit to use to access both central government and the THA to coordinate uh, any investment interest in this area. Yeah. And with that, we bid you adieu.